to Bharat Anand, esteemed Harvard professor, legendary author of The Content Trap, and a brilliant man who's going to moderate our next panel. How's that for an introduction? <laughs> Hell yeah. That was, that was a unique introduction. <laughs> so, thank you, Nico. Uh, pleasure to have you all here for our, our guest, our last panel of the day. Is that excellent? Okay. Um, so let me first introduce our uh, speakers, and I'll move from left to right. Uh, we have Kerry Hoffman, who's the CEO of PRX, which is um, how many of you have heard of PRX? Yeah. So this is like a central player in the in the public media content space, podcasting. So we're going to talk about that, and she's played uh, an important role in building and developing uh, PRX. Also, headed up the launch of Radio Topia. Uh, uh, next to her is uh, Tim Gans, uh, who brings 15 years of experience in sales, business development, and enterprise account management, the Echo Nest. Um, before that, he was the founder and CEO of Songspar Productions, which was a social music game development startup. Uh, has worked a lot in uh, providing SaaS solutions to Fortune 500 companies. So Echo Nest was bought by Spotify mm -hmm. a few years ago. and. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot about data and music with, uh, with Tim. Uh, Brendan Eich, uh, co-founder and CEO of Brave Software, which is a startup that, if things go well, is going to solve all the problems we've been talking about for the day. <laughs> um, so uh, Brendan was previously CTO, then CEO of uh, Mozilla, uh, co-founded the Mozilla Project and Foundation, helped launch uh, Firefox, and is the inventor of JavaScript. So we're going to talk technology with Brendan. And finally, Janet Bayless uh, on my immediate left. Uh, I think she's probably seen every part of media, starting with Time Warner, then AOL. Uh, Betaworks was the publisher of the Huffington Post for several years, and is now a partner in leading EY's advisory services and their consulting business globally for media and entertainment. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for joining. It's a fantastic uh, panel, and as you might have noticed, in some sense, this last panel um, is moving a little bit away from content per se as we start talking about adjacent media spaces, and then sort of try and understand what's happening there and bring it back, right? Um, and so think about sort of who we have here as content, technology, data, um, audio, advertising, like sprinkle it. So I'd like to start with, um, with Janet. Uh, you've obviously been spending a lot of time working with media companies yeah. in the last few years, um, having been in one yourself, uh, looking at sort of just a range of business models, which obviously is a, is a big topic that people are talking about. Um, how aggressively are media companies innovating on business models? Are they innovating aggressively enough? Can you just give us a few examples of what's caught your attention? Sure. Um, I think that I'm fortunate to have the vantage point of our media practice really spanning the full range of media and entertainment companies, and it's probably helpful to ground some of my comments in, in that perspective. So we're working with everyone from the agencies to the broadcasting cable networks to traditional publishers uh, to the cable and satellite operators, film TV, OTT players, you name it, sort of runs the gamut. And what's striking to me across that full universe is, before we talk about business models and whether or not we're innovating enough there, one has to look at the consumers. Because typically, consumers lead and business models follow. And I think, generally, consumers, especially in this moment, are moving faster than we can catch up with them. And, uh, and so when you look at every aspect of what drives the media business model, um, we are in a state of extreme disruption. So I would say the first thing is everyone recognizes that, and everyone recognizes um, that the bar for innovation and devoting ourselves to aggressive um, transformation is, is, is there. That said, are they moving fast enough? Everyone's somewhere on the spectrum. I think if you look at the content side, and I think the last conversation obviously was really focused predominantly on news and journalism and, um, and, and, and some of the challenges there. If you start with content itself, 
if you, if you broaden to the media and entertainment ecosystem, you know, we are unquestionably in a tremendous revolution of investment and opportunity around content. You know, when you've got new entrants who are spending billions of dollars in original content, and frankly driving the price of content up, um, relative to the traditional players, it's hard to say that there isn't an opportunity to make money off of content. Again, we'll put news and journalism aside, recognizing that we've shifted in sort of into the adjacent spaces. Um, uh, and, and certainly from a creator standpoint, again, as, as was alluded to on the last panel, this is a moment of tremendous revolution. So content alive well and the content is king statement, I think we can, we can stand by that um, uh, in a really robust way. If we shift to distribution, you know, we've been going through a sea shift change there, which again, it's worth leaning into, which is we no longer can build media or content as a destination. We can't get the person to the thing. We have to bring the thing to the people, right? And so the, and those people are across venues, nodes of the network, platforms, experiences, screens, whatever you want to say. And so obviously that presents tremendous challenges and, and our control and the business models that follow each of those platforms is very, very different. Um, and, and the discovery of how we find that content, you know, the conversation that we just had around search and social becoming dominant ways that, that people discover content in that distributed landscape, that's not changing. And so, and in fact, we have yet to discover the next generations of, uh, of discovery. So is it going to be voice or uh, a host of other things that lead us to, to um, those new forms of discovery? So then you get to monetization, because now we've got content and it's finding people, but we haven't yet found the money that, that goes along with that. And part of the challenge that I think everyone recognizes is some of the places people are moving have very different economics than where they were before. So you move from, let's call it traditional dollars to digital dimes to maybe mobile pennies. And so that's the first thing is that we're living in an upside down world. And then um, the value chain is being disrupted. So, um, the, the high level comment would just be that I think everyone is moving towards diversification. They're looking very seriously at acquisitions, although they have to, the, you know, the value has to be right, the strategic fit has to be right, but you're definitely seeing a trend more broadly towards a diversification, um, native content and branded studios as a way for people to tap into the creativity that sits in a media organization and start to bring that um, to advertisers as a service as opposed to simply selling the space and the value of the consumer. Um, and, and certainly a lot of moves which um, are somewhat ironic for me, having been at AOL from 2004 to 2007 where we were shifting from subscriptions to advertising, we're now seeing a resurgence of advertising moving back to subscriptions. Um, so, you know, I think you're seeing mostly a lot of experimentation. I think people are thinking about what's that ultimate willingness to pay of the consumer, what's the right bundle, what's the value exchange with the consumer. So whether it's AMC partnering with Comcast to do AMC Premiere and offer an ad-free experience for amazing content like Mad Men and Breaking Bad and everything else that, um, that people may enjoy there, you can experience that without advertising. That's an example of a new business model. See a lot of experimentation from the broadcast and cable networks thinking about what their OTT play looks like and how that positions them relative to traditional distribution, which has gone through the pipe of obviously a cable or satellite operator. And they're making tough choices between the current ecosystem of distribution and what they perceive and we see as the future state of distribution. So there, there's some wonderful experiments out there. You know, you see uh, BuzzFeed was mentioned on the last panel. Buzz, BuzzFeed, which traditionally had built their model around native, uh, started accepting new forms of advertising recently. And so I think everyone is in a state of experimentation. Is it enough to go back to your question? I'm not sure. Um, I think that um, probably everyone needs to be more aggressive, but the challenge is, Fundamentally, we're managing a duality of the present state of the business and the future, and we're building the plane as we fly it, and for, particularly for publicly traded companies, let alone uh, a, any other form where you're accountable to uh, investors and shareholders, it's an incredibly difficult moment to make that pivot given all the variables in play. Hmm. Great, that's a fantastic start. By the way, uh, just in terms of format, so we're just gonna walk through each of the panelists and give them some space to actually talk about the issue at hand. And then we'll just have an interchange and try and offer some perspective that combines these. Let me just stick, uh, Janet, with what you said. So in some sense, uh, you, you were the publisher at HuffPo. 
in some sense, the, the, the idea of native really originated there um, when you were there. You've seen sort of how it's grown, um, and also in some sense a cycle here, right? I mean, people first saying, whoa, native, now let's embrace it, sort of as a first order implication in terms of the ability to offer a new revenue source for publishers. Um, sort of how close are we? Are we sort of past that hump? So sort of just offer some perspective here. Well, I, I will give uh, Ari Ariana and the Huffington Post a, immense credit for what they did to advance the state of native content. Um, you know, we had a, uh, you know, we were invested in a branded content team independent of the editorial organization uh, long before that was mm -hmm. what was in vogue. But I would say having started at Time Inc. in 1999, um, you know, the, and at a moment where uh, we had something called the advertorial, um, which was sponsored content that sat on a page just like editorial and was similarly formatted and often deployed people with similar skill sets to the core journalistic teams, you know, there, there's no question that this is not, this is not a new model. Mm -hmm. I think that the reason um, that it, it is an imperative right now, uh, there are a couple things going on. Um, one, um, there is somewhat of a, um, a recognition that consumers want to take control of their own experience. And, and especially with younger audiences, they have a keen appreciation for the value exchange that they are, they are making when they consume content and see advertising. And so when we look at trends like ad blocking or the fact that nine out of 10 people who can skip a commercial do, unquestionably it's a call to action to integrate more deeply in the content. And by the way, it's been happening in television since the advent of television, right? Um, when we think about uh, sponsored content from the, you know, from the very beginning. I think that the imperative to do it well and to do it at scale is more pronounced than ever before because over time there's no question in any form of ad supported media there will start to be somewhat of a scarcity of high quality supply mm -hmm. near premium content by definition based on again the consumer behavior leading and the business model following. Um, so, you know, so I think native content, branded content studios, tapping into the creativity of a brand We've been we've been evolving on that path. It's simply accelerated based on the consumer reality. And it's key. Um, I, I think that uh, you know someone mentioned the IAB on the uh, on the the last in the last conversation. I think by definition, things that um, are really going to scale have to have some level of standardization. I think uh, that that native, if it is truly native. By definition, it's very hard to scale that um, and really make it native. You know, and there's some degree of question as to what's truly authentic um, in an editorial environment. I think for organizations that have scale, mm -hmm. that it can scale very quickly. And right now, um, you know, what we're what we're clearly seeing is that players who have scale around data can move those businesses and the audience even faster. So whether it's a you know a concentration of data around consumer intent or purchasing or programming or, um, or any other dimension, you know, we're certainly seeing that scale is, uh, yeah. is beneficial regardless. Yeah. Great, no, thank you. Uh, by the way, I think that, that conversation sort of captures three elements which are probably, which are probably applied in many forms of new revenue generation, which is A, is there value to be created yeah. here? Uh, I think there the answer is clearly yes. B, sort of what are the organizational implications? Mm -hmm. And this was the old church, church state question. Yeah. You know, as I think Jay Law from Quartz said this morning, um, you know, there's, there's two separate questions here, right? One is, one is just the, the, the integrity of mm -hmm. separating or yep. combining those two, and clearly, you know, you want separation there, but that's different from the question of alignment or sharing information. And then the third question is, can it scale, mm -hmm. right? Is this something that's of first order importance or sort of a nice incremental revenue stream, Sure. right? Uh, speaking of ads, and uh, maybe we can turn to Brendan which I'm gonna do with a deep breath, because uh, there's a paper, by the way, I don't know if anyone's read this, Basic Attention Token Blockchain-Based Digital Advertising. Uh, so for those of you who've read it, um, maybe you can explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> those who haven't, like, you know, take your time. <laughs> so, uh, so just tell us, uh, Brendan, what this is about, and uh, I'd love if you can do it without using the words ledger or cryptocurrency. <laughs> That's impossible. Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, maybe I should define them because yeah. if you know um, about double entry bookkeeping, you know what a ledger is. So what's been invented um, 
there are a couple of people who took runs. I'm not going to give the credit accurately, but over time, and then through the magic of someone under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto, the sort of way of doing um, bookkeeping without a third trusted party bookkeeper between two people, two or more people, uh, evolved. And, and Bitcoin is an implementation of this. It has its own um, public ledger, decentralized. It's copied around uh, a peer-to-peer -peer network of computers around the world. It, it's big. It gets bigger over time. Um, and there's also an Ethereum, which has a, its own public ledger and its own different sort of approach to computing new state um, and is more powerful and can, can do arbitrary computations that can be recorded in the ledger and everyone can reach consensus on. So you don't need to uh, have a trusted intermediary uh, because those are considered security holes. Okay, so that's, a le that's what I think you mean by ledger. And, and it, these are also used to implement digital money. Uh, depending on your definition of money. Some people say money has to have the, you know, the king's face on it, but um, digital currency does not, and it, it is cryptographically um, sound. There's a cryptographic protocol, so there's a sort of um, secure way of, of counting the money and, and attributing the money to uh, a certain position uh, on the public ledger that you can be sure it's not being double spent, that it's not being embezzled, things like that. So digital currency has some nice properties. Um, everybody who uses a credit card and anybody who's a merchant knows there's a sort of overhead to doing credit card charges. And the merchant generally pays it. The interchange charge can be like two, two and a quarter percent, sometimes more. And there's actually a hidden fraud cost, which is usually also eaten by the merchant um, because credit cards get stolen and credit card fraud happens. Um, with digital currencies, you can transact without any intermediary, so there's no interchange charge. There's, there's a fee if you want to um, have the, the confirmation of consensus happen in, in, a, in a faster way than usual. In Bitcoin, it just happens over time, and you have to wait. Uh, Ethereum has a, a fee built, built into its blockchain, so its ledger, I should say, so that um, anybody trying to attack it and uh, destroy the network has to pay to do so. Anybody even accidentally doing arbitrary computations that run away will, will pay a fee for every cycle, and that, that puts a damper on, on such um, you know, mistakes and, and, and hacks. Um, but it's, it's a low fee. It's like basis points are lower, um, generally, if the network's not congested. And so th this is a more efficient way of transmitting funds. And since there's no intermediary, you also avoid sort of FinCEN and the equivalent in Europe regulations. You don't need a money transmitter license if you, you that is us brave, for instance, does not actually hold custody of the digital currency. Okay. <laughs> so that's like the, the two-minute explanation of blockchain and Bitcoin. Yeah. And by the way, there's like 50 TED Talks talking about this for like 20 minutes each. It's, um, it can go but on. But that's the, that's the background. Okay, so, so let's say we get that, which, you know, my guess is probably many of us do. Then sort of extending it to the digital ad system, right? So now... Now help us understand this. Maybe I can say how I got involved in, in this whole area. I was um, advising a company called Sonobi, which is a, started out as a supply-side platform. Yeah. So helping publishers get better ads, sort of premium programmatic, um, header bidding. And I, I, you know, I met a bunch of people in the course of uh, advising Sonobi, um, Terry Kawaja of Luma Partners, and um, the former publisher of, of of Forbes, Jim Spanfeller, and opinions varied, but I realized there was a system involved in digital advertising which used JavaScript, which I created 22 years ago in a tear and hurry, and it was really a bad system. It was, it was kind of corrupt, and it had lots of uh, fraud and, and malware entry points, and it had too many intermediaries, and it, everyone was sort of cheating everybody else. Um, there was a lot of suspicion. Um, Money comes in from marketers, you know, from driving sales for brands, and it flows through this Lumascape, it's called, after the Luma Partners, Terry's company, uh, merger and acquisition, iBanking, of the companies in the middle that um, intermediate to help get ads from the, the buy side, the marketing side, placed into slots that publishers provide. And... Sonobi does a pretty good job, but I, I soon realized that not only is, is there, are there too many middle players and there's sort of um, loose arrangements that lead to fraud and other problems, um, 
and, and annoying ads which drive people to block um, ads. It, it also became uh, clear to me that, that there was massive tracking going on. There was like huge surveillance, which actually came out in the Snowden news when uh, Snowden uh, leaked, uh, I think, Prism. Something was using Google cookies in, in the course of doing this kind of uh, unlawful surveillance. So it, we've got an ad tech complex that's not only doing a kind of inefficient job with digital advertising, um, some people say, you know, 16 billion in fraud this year. No, nobody really knows. Um, 7.2 billion last year. I, I don't know if these numbers are too big or too small. They're big. That's in the U.S. and that's out of maybe uh, 72 billion last year on digital in the U.S. So there's a big fraud problem. But then the tracking also uh, is a problem, and it's not visible. You, you see a bad ad or an annoying animated ad or an interstitial, um, and you kind of can decide you don't like that, maybe you get an ad blocker. Tracking is, is invisible, and you only um, come to perceive it with help of tools like Ghostry, which draws these nice graphs, or I think Mezzobit was shown by uh, David. Um, you, you see all these um, entities, like parasites. It looks like something out of a biology textbook that are sort of clustered around the, the publisher. And you're relating to the publisher. You have to know who the site you're going to. That's important for banking and things like that. You have to understand if there's a a real stepped up secure connection to that bank. Uh, but you don't really understand all the third parties that are integrated, often through JavaScript, that are tracking you or doing other things. And sometimes the publishers don't understand them either. That's something James Van Feller told me. He said, they lose track of integrations and partners. They leave the old ones around, and they just slow the page down. So what, what um, motivated Brave was defending against all of these problems by blocking everything. Sounds aggressive. UC Browser did it in Asia. Browsers normally, the big browsers don't do this. It's no coincidence that they all either are advertising companies or kind of depend on, on search uh, revenue sharing deals, so they depend on advertising. But it's a big boat, and none of them really wants to rock it. But we're a small browser, and we can do that. So we block by default. And I think it's, it's within users' rights to do so. That There are threats, like I said, malware, ransomware coming through ad exchanges. Um, the ads are not just annoying. The trackers actually take a lot of your bandwidth. So Estimates go as high as $23 a month if you're paying for tiered data from the scripts. And if you block them, you just get a much faster performance. Your battery doesn't drain as fast. You don't pay that data charge. Um, some of the data from the New York Times was then analyzed by Rob Leather, and he wrote a Medium piece, he's now on Facebook, that said the mobile operators are making more off of, <laughs> off of the data charges than the publishers are getting in the revenue that's left after all these, these parasites take their slices. So, System seems unhealthy, and Brave's first approach is to clean the slate, but that seems destructive, right? It's not ecologically sound. It's protecting the user, but it's hurting the publisher. And we appreciate that, so we're using cryptocurrencies and their decentralized ledgers to try to enable uh, intermedi intermediary free payment of publishers and even users from things like contributions users willingly make also, ad revenue, we haven't turned this on yet, we're building it, ads that can be shown to users in a private tab and give the user the bulk of the revenue from the ad to accumulate, it's not a lot of money, into a, um, what's called a wallet for cryptocurrency. It's, it's actually one of these um, nodes on the ledger, and entries on the ledger. Um, and then that can trickle back automatically without any extra overhead in deciding to your top sites. You can pin your favorite sites, things like that. So we're trying to put features that have been done through remote surveillance and too many middle players. We're trying to block all that and put the mediation close to the user in the user's agent, the trusted user agent, which is the other name for the browser. Your browser sees all your, your banking data. That's where the secure connection terminates. Your browser has to hold that at least temporarily and present it to you. You have to trust your browser. Um, and I asked this in the talk I gave uh, at the university the other day, how many people use Chrome? I think David may have mentioned this already. So if you heard his talk, I'll not be telling you anything new. How many of you log into Chrome, upper right corner? Not just cookies, but you actually log into Chrome. How many of you opted out of the Google account setting that says since 2016 that your browser history can be used for ad targeting? Fewer hands. A lot of people don't know that privacy policy change happened. It did. Um, I think it's just an inevitable um, business, you know, temptation to go, once you have a big browser and you're an ad company, to take the user's history. 
it's kind of shocking because that history is very sensitive, right? That's, that's not necessarily different from your medical history, to David's point earlier today. Um, and it can actually anticipate your medical history. So um, it, there are serious issues here that are not well regulated, uh, not, not protected in law. Um, if, if you believe in the vision we're putting forward, you don't just get control of your own data and defend, defense against malware, you also get a piece of the action. Money's not everything, but it signifies some, something. You're, you're not the product anymore. Now you're, you're part of the, the deal. Um, and you get control over rewarding sites. So you can actually say, I want to pin a part of my monthly budget to this site, whether I browse there or not. And more beyond that, we haven't built, um, think about the friction involved in getting someone to subscribe or open their wallet and get out their credit card or, or even do PayPal. If you have crypto tokens, basic attention tokens, in your wallet, suddenly it's not a big deal to do, you know, a, a couple of bucks uh, upsell or some premium thing. And that lower friction, I think, means there's a whole, whole sort of price range to be colonized. We saw, you know, Netflix go uh, in their lowest tier under, you know, $8. We saw Pandora go to 6 I think these are great brands, and, and you can only have so many of them. But if every publisher wanted to do that, they couldn't possibly pull it off. If we put the payment technology in the browser and make it frictionless and secure, then I think every publisher could participate. It would be something that you would do while browsing. It would be one of those things that should have been standardized. When the web was standardized in the 90s, JavaScript and cookies and images, things that are used for tracking were all standardized. But the rest of it evolved uh, very much like biological life on top, and nothing was standardized. It was all bespoke. That's why there's so many different systems for doing this. And you have to reconcile them. I know publishers have problems reconciling discrepancies in their reporting when they use multiple ad partners. It should have been standardized. So one of the things that we aim to do at Brave is not just corner the market. We're not going to do that. But to be a, a, an influential small player who, along with GDPR and e-privacy in Europe, can move the needle on privacy and advance better web standards at the higher domain of discourse. Great. Um, so can I just try and sort of capture a little bit of what you were saying. So there's, there's almost three parts to this problem, right? Actually, there's many parts, but so one is ad blocking. And so like that's the first part. Yes. But of course, just blocking ads, it doesn't solve the ad problem. And tracker blocking. So yes. that's one. Second is then how do you generate revenues? And ultimately, that must come down to pricing attention somehow. Yes. Which could either take the form of I compensate you as the user for watching an ad, or I measure what you're watching more accurately and then you know, pay the publisher based on that. Is, are you trying to solve both those problems? Yes, I think to do ads right, we will inevitably do more conventional partnering with publishers as an indirect ad vendor. All the ad vendors mediate their, their partnering through JavaScript tags in the page anyway. And if we block those and do something secure in, in the browser that could be a future standard, it's kind of the same, but it's more. there are fewer middle players, it's more secure, and it can be actually anonymous. We can okay. avoid tracking and targeting. Okay. And how do you measure attention in this model? So we have, in the paper, we talk about a basic attention metric, and it's very much like chart beats. It's based on view count and visit time. The browser can measure this accurately. If you know about viewability and the various <coughs> viewability um, debacles <coughs> in the industry where Facebook has had to restate uh, how many videos were actually viewed, um, or you know, Google's had similar issues. Um, it's hard to measure remotely that, first of all, there was a real human viewing your, your ad. And then if it was a real human, that was the ad really above the fold? Was it really in front of the sort of Z order stack of the CSS rendering model? Um, sometimes there's cheating and people put content on top of ads. Getting credit for a view is hard. And then things like view through attribution, where you sort of see that Starbucks promotion as you get close to 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you really need a coffee. Finally, after seeing it four times, you click on it. The various sites where you saw it get a share of the revenue. There's massive cheating there. Um, with what we're doing, which has higher integrity implemented in the browser, we can know exactly what the user is doing. Uh, we don't want to do eye tracking. That's pretty creepy. <laughs> um, don't want to do minority report. But we know what's visible. We know what's above the fold. We know when the user is scrolling, we know when the screensaver is on. So it can be much more accurate. Great, thank you. So obviously, a lot to come back to, but uh, that's helpful. Uh, Tim. 
Yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me uh, really glad that we're in a closed platform at Spotify. Um, don't have as many of those issues to deal with, but they all make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously a simpler model mm -hmm. that, that you have, but you're coming to this and trying to actually really leverage the data in many dimensions now at Spotify. Yeah. Just if you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, just going back prior to our acquisition from Spotify, we were um, a, you know, completely focused on content level understanding. And the subject area in our case was music. And we, you know, basically supplied that data. We had to, you know, and hearkening back to the comments of the previous speakers, we had to pivot on that model maybe, you know, a half a dozen times in earnest, like, and to, to finally find, you know, really where we could monetize this information. Um, all the information from music services is basically the same. So there's parity. Everybody's got the same catalog. Um, and you know, we were going to be the distinction that you could make, and if you could leverage our data more powerfully than the, the next, you know, the next music service or media company, um, then, you know, you'd win. That was basically what our, what our, you know, our hope was. Um, so Spotify wanted to kind of remove this technology from the market, from their competitors, and, uh, you know, kind of innovate and really double down on data as a differentiator since the content is all the same. Um, so Spotify was, I mean, the Echo Nest uh, was the first of four, you know, data acquisitions. I don't think Spotify's done. I think mm -hmm. they're going to continue to invest in this space as a, as a key competitive dif differentiator. So the data side itself started as just understanding, you know, music as good as possible using all of the the new technologies afforded by the digital realm to understand music at a at a deeper level than you ever could before. So the you know the kind of things that you'd see in like a Pandora station, like the the genome project, we did it with machine listening. So we would understand the pitch, key, tempo, time signature, uh, psychoacoustic measures of music in the same way that the human ear would perceive it. Um, but that's kind of maybe less than half of a good descriptor of what music is. The, the really important driver for you know, mass marketed music is around who's sharing, what people think of it. It's really the cultural attributes of music that are really the most difficult to measure and understand and utilize correctly to an audience. So we worked very hard on that. We used a lot of the same approaches, a lot of web crawling, understand how people were describing music, a lot of different approaches to um, you know, figuring out this cultural signal, um, which was you know, good enough for us to have a, a fairly saturated market of people using the Echonet. So we were an arms dealer, and everybody pretty much had our stuff, and it was up to them to be you know, more clever than the, their competitors on how they deployed it. Um, but when Spotify bought us, you know, we, we learned things that we just never knew because we all of a sudden had a very engaged, closed platform of people that were very, very engaged in music so that all of a sudden we had this brand new signal that's now louder than anything else. And it's helped, you know, data, the way we think about it is, um, you know, it's, it's their connective tissue that kind of help with you to relate one thing to another, the more data points you have, it's just like more fibers that connect that tissue. So you can make these correlations in a more strong, confident way. So, um, you know, with a hunt now where there's 140 million uh, really engaged users on Spotify, so we have a lot of signal to go on, and we've now, you know, basically been, that's been our focus, is, is providing that back to the user community to just harness this behavioral data so that to improve the experience on Spotify. Um, it went so well that we've now, you know, over the last couple of years, we're finding new constituents for this data because it's useful in, in multiple ways. And it, it's, I think it's testament to the original technology because we just know so much about the content that once we see people engaging with the content, it's much easier for us to measure it. So, um, 
about two years ago, we started focusing that those data um, solutions on providing the artists and the creators that are contributing to the platform um, so that they had this data, that they understood what their audience was doing better. They could start you know, using it in various ways. We think it's kind of early days, but they could start using it for the development of new content and things that you know, they were never able to do before. Um, and over the last year, because that went really well, um, we are now focused on providing that data to advertisers and starting to understand more about how they can leverage it in a real powerful way to you know, get closer to, the, to our audience. Can you just give us some con concrete examples for how the data is being used to help the content creators and then also the users? Is this just recommendations or is it more than that? Oh, it's not a recommendation at all no. on the content creator side. No, not on the content creator side. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, so like just to level set with the audience, if anybody's used Discover Weekly or uh, the Daily Mix or any of these features on Spotify, that's all powered by this content level understanding. It's using a variety of different data science principles, and music has always been notoriously a difficult recommendation problem, but the missing ingredient was a captive active audience and once you have that you know 140 million people spending two and a half hours a day doing things sharing sending playing music it's a just a really strong signal to be able to understand more about you know music recommendation in general but for content creators you know we're giving them visibility that they never had before like the 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 first aha moment i had with it was we were doing some analysis for for beck who's a, a recording artist that's difficult to classify into one genre. It kind of spans kind of multiple sounds. And there were um, nearly 100,000 people that had listened to Beck every day for the last four months. And it just kind of dawned on me that that's information that never existed ever before. Um, you knew when you had units sold, like Beck knew he was a good artist when he went platinum, but he didn't understand that he was in part of a daily lifestyle of almost 100,000 people. Um, so we got to work on kind of figuring out who those people were, and that was the, the jumping off point for, you know, what we would provide to them. So it's really allowing creators to get closer and understand their audience better, and there's just a lot of tactical, you know, uh, endpoints to it. So they can plan tours better. Right. They can understand their content that's most popular. Um, they can understand their audience, like who it is. Um, you know, many creators are dismayed to understand the composition of their audience, you know, whether it be more male or more female or, um, um, but also just like very similar to the kind of things that Kim was talking about, the, the level of engagement. So the depth, frequency, and volume of listening. So is it just something that was thrown on an owned and operated playlist that somebody just heard in the background or was it active listening where somebody's truly engaged yeah. in the content. Um, and that kind of, if you can measure that kind of content, yeah. uh, that kind of passion, that's a really valuable thing for a creator to yeah. know. Um, so there's a lot of examples yeah. like okay. that. You know, we, so we've, you know, another tactical is we can help them reach out to their audience, invite them to do things with them. Yeah. They can run shows for them. Like, sure. it just allows them to get a lot closer. Right. Right. Um, so it's not necessarily feeding back into the content creation process, but no, we're hoping that it does, audience. though. I mean, I think I think eventually you can see it. Like once you start understanding, you know, if you have this acoustic data, yeah. and you can give them reports on the level of, you know, the, the the average tempo and time signature of the songs that are most often played by their biggest fans, that definitely would inform the production of future content. Hasn't happened yet, but it's all pretty early. All right. And um, I don't know if that's too creepy, like the eyes, yeah. but. Yeah. Um, those, but so, yeah, so, so then the, the next leg of the stool is, you know, for artists, like the, the best way to make money is through brands. And we want to try to facilitate a relationship between the brand and the right artist, and data is the best way to make these connections. Excellent. Uh, thank you. By the way, yesterday I think I saw one of the best Facebook posts I've ever seen. This was a old high school classmate of mine who sent me this link to kids, like 10-year-olds listening to Led Zeppelin songs and just <laughs> reacting. Like, 
you know, what do they think of it? I was trying to think if they had the data on these kids. Like, anyway, that's too creepy. <laughs> um, Kerry, uh, so people keep talking about video being the next big thing in digital media, and you're betting on audio? Absolutely. Tell us why. Um, well, and I was also just thinking about the flaws in your algorithms, because now my suggested playlist at Spotify say, like, more stress-free listening, <laughs> which is actually <laughs> is more stressful. And <laughs> i got to change my habits so that I'm not having some creepy... I've gotta, I need more punk, punk rock music in my, in my Spotify. Um, so we're making a bet on audio for a lot of reasons. Um, so PRX is a nonprofit media company, and we have been in the broadcast, you know, we work in broadcast, so we distribute big shows, This American Life, The Moth, Reveal, and we also are very active in distributing podcasts. And so for us, we look at the landscape, and we both curate and create content. We train kind of what we hope is the next generation of makers. We have a podcast garage down the street here that we do some of that. At, and we use technology creatively to do, to do all of that. And we think of technology much more like the uh, mortar between the bricks as opposed to a thing that is an enabler. And, you know, the, the podcast industry is new, and so I feel very optimistic about how it's evolving and changing. Um, stories are what really propel people forward beyond reading data, et cetera, and so the human connection is much deeper, and through voice, you can use your imagination, et cetera. So there's loads of reasons to lean into that. Now, with the advent of smart speakers, um, we, can, we, we can find that sweet spot where the simplicity of the turning on a dial on a radio can match the power of and choices that on-demand affords. Um, the thing about, you know, listening Listening down the line here, as we go from uh, money to blockchain and to data, and now you know to think about content is um, and some of the conversations today about you know filter bubbles and fake news and branded content and you know in our business we you know podcasting is a disaggregated media and I really want to lean into that because I think that's actually where we can strengthen the access points of who the next generation of makers are. It allows us to create more opportunities for diversity and many, many other things that are important for a democratic society. And the piece that, you know, we, we still need money and we still need fuel to make our shows. We focus on the makers as opposed to the audience. Mm -hmm. Our makers focus on the audience. They're, you know, we're a proxy in some ways. But we focus on the on the makers, and so that's why it's easy for us to lean into that. And you know the um, the next, you know, we work with individuals, and we also work with the biggest podcasters in the world. And there's some real commonality. And, and, and just to take a second, if you were to take Ira Glass, who's what, who's has the most successful group of podcasts, and you were to say to somebody today, you know, I've got a great podcast for you. It's like three chapters kind of about America, um, it would never see the light of day. But because he has built up a, a huge platform and then stories get launched off of that, we can create, so we have to kind of work in three sections. We have to have technology that is an enabler. We have to have a network effect that allows for um, jumping off points like This American Life, um, that's a 20-year-old program. But we also have to have excellence, and we have to have new ways for excellence to find their way in. And, and that is one of the great challenges of um, the platformization and some of the more uh, siloed media that's happening. And I will say that many of the individuals that we work with um, are really slow to embrace <laughs> Advertising, when we launched Radiotopia a couple of years ago, we sat around with seven shows and we sat around a conference table and most of them said, do we really have to do ads? And, you know, the answer is, well, of course not. I'm sure it'll be fine. You know, you'll make a couple of shows a year and your mom will love them. I mean, it's great. So, so in order to, like, really think about success and, you know, shorten that ramp of success, 
we have to, we're doing an enormous amount of educating, both on how ads can work, what the traps are, how we pull this lever, pull that lever. And, you know, we can go from that conversation three years ago into helping our shows understand the power of ad technology is a, it's a major, it's a major shift. And to have them be successful in order to keep making content is really the end game. Can I, um, Janet, when Janet was talking about native, you know, we were talking about sort of these three layers of questions that arise with any new kind of revenue stream or opportunity, which is, A, is there value creation? And clearly in audio ads or audio in general, there seems to have been. Second is when you realize, or when everyone realizes, all oh, there's value creation possibilities here, and then there's competition, and everyone floods the market, and then the question is, how do you get discovered, which is one of the things you were alluding to. How does great content rise to the top? And the third question is scalability, which is, is great if we can create podcasts sort of one or two at a time or at a small scale within an organization or a publisher? Is this something that can scale? Can you speak to those second and third questions? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the bet that we make is on um, quality and that kind of massive connectivity that we can create either by the networks we have. And if you have an open enough door, then you're just inviting more people on to accelerate that access. And um, the, there are so many smart technologists trying to figure out how discovery improves. And it, it will happen. I mean, I think that the, the issue is, is um, you know, audio is still, a, you know, it's like a bit of a black box on your media devices, and so that's part of it. So there's companies that make transcriptions that allow for greater um, searchability, et cetera. But, you know, many podcasters found because someone tells them, tell, you know, tells is a recommendation. Uh, but, but that's also true in many forms of media. Some of my favorite television shows are because people that I are in my circle say, you should check out such and such. So that isn't as, as broken. But you know, the next generation is really going to uh, do all this on mobile. And you know, we launched a company last, last year called Radio Public to really kind of double down and focus on not just how people find, but what happens, what's the stickiness. You know, the, the way I describe it to our shows is we need to be um, open as much as we can and then and then be as sticky as we possibly can and, and getting that at the right time and and figuring out how we make um, it's not so much that if you like this show you'll like that show that's that's sort of obvious but it's also how you move through um, topics and how we all have the responsibility to open our media consumption up to more variety. And that is getting more and more challenging. Mm -hmm. And the branded content actually makes that even harder because it's, it's I mean, it, you, it makes sense in some cases that brands think that they can do content a little bit better than publishers because there's so many, there's, there's a lot of garbage out there for sure. Um, and in the podcast world, most podcasts are actually in support of another business. We're in the, we're in a unique spot where we have shows that are shows. They're narrative storytelling shows. But a lot of podcasting is actually supporting another internet business. It's really a, it's a customer acquisition yeah. for a different business. Yeah. That's, that's really common. Yeah. And clearly you're tapping into the long tail of content creators mm -hmm. as, well as, as well as some of the majors. Who's betting on podcasts uh, right now in terms of the major publishers? And can you just give us some examples of- Well, yeah, I mean, there's the-, the the radio, I mean, the radio market is a multi-billion dollar market that is, it is, um, you know, it's ripe for disruption. And um, the smart speakers are like lining things up perfectly for, for more audio, um, voice activation, et cetera. And there's recently been a lot of money pouring in for, in the mobile space and the technology space on, uh, in our, in uh, podcasting, which is great. That's actually a proof positive of our industry, and it's a good endorsement of it. All the money that's going to Gimlet and all the money that's going to some of the other mobile producers, uh, mobile app creators, allow it's just another marker for us to say, okay, we're, we're doing the right thing. Fabulous. All right, I want to open up soon, but before that, just make sense of, or at least try to connect the dots across these conversations. And since 
you're a Harvard Business School graduate, you're used to doing that, so I'm going to rely on you to actually cold call. connect the dots. <laughs> that was sure. a cold call. Yeah, so it's just incredibly interesting to hear the conversation, and particularly in light of the last discussion, which was, you know, sort of some of the downsides and real risks and concerns about data and technology and what it means to a consumer and to the business and, and ultimately to content and journalism. What's interesting to me is, you know, we're talking about fragmentation unquestionably and, uh, and technology and data unlock dramatically new value in all the stories we just heard. And, and so when I think about the traditional value chain, uh, and let's go uh, in advertising, a marketer spends money they usually are advised by an agency who's bringing intelligence and, and expertise to help them transact with media companies. Those media companies are then um, basically hiring the makers or paying the makers, creators, um, who then attract audiences. And so that's a pretty mm -hmm. long way between somebody with advertising dollars and, um, and somebody who's a creator at the other end of the spectrum. And so all along that value chain, I think what, what some of these different stories are unlocking is the opportunity for disintermediation. Um, something like blockchain um, allows us to connect lots of different parts of the network. I'll use my non-technologically advanced version of this. But you know, to be able to transact around either data or currency or content, it's unlocking new opportunities and it's allowing us to jump different steps in that value chain. Um, the story, and all of that is ultimately going to be powered by data and both the story of PRX and, um, and, and the story of, um, of Echo, I was going to say Spotify, so uh, Echo, Echo Nest, right? I wish to make sure, forgive me. I want to make sure I get the brand right. So an Echo Nest, I think, really tells, uh, tell the story of if we have the right data and we can uh, have a secure way to transact around data and content, essentially this is a story of connecting supply and demand and creating fluidity in marketplaces. And I think fluidity only accelerates our opportunity to create value. Um, if we think about it for the early internet companies, fluidity was created by uh, a lot of different technologies that allowed us, for example, to aggregate supply or aggregate demand or pay more seamlessly. And we're moving towards a world where that's happening in this whole landscape for content um, and for marketers to, to reach audiences. And so, but for this kind of thinking around data and technology, I think it's hard to imagine how you can put, the, the, um, uh, put it all back in the box. Mm -hmm. The fragmentation, again, the consumer's already done that. They've already taken all the pieces apart. They've exploded the, the, the concept of the destination. And so the only hope and, uh, for creating value out of all of this is to build scale, not necessarily in one place, but across multiple places, thinking about the power of technology to create and data to create those marketplaces and enable the transactions. And I think ultimately, to bring it back to the consumer, you know, I think there's some very uh, important questions that were raised around consumer privacy and consumer uh, understanding of what's happening around them. I think at some point, you know, we're talking about this in a very B2B context, one can envision uh, in an optimistic scenario a, a, a world where some of these technologies, including um, uh, blockchain, may even enable the consumer to own their own data. And so whereas right now, their, their value exchange is for the content experience, and then everybody else gets to transact on their data. Imagine if you owned your own identity and your own persona in the world and chose what you did or did not want to be compensated for things. So I think over time, while, while I think it's very daunting, I think this probably over time leads to more transparency, more fluidity in marketplaces, and ultimately, and hopefully, more value creation. Okay. So if I, can, if I can just, that's very helpful. If I can just sort of make one observation and then a question for all the panelists. Um, just to, coming back to this question of what are the implications for publishers, in some sense tying it back to that, that question. So, so what I find interesting is, just in terms of revenue models we're seeing by looking at the adjacencies, right? Uh, there's all kinds of possibilities here, and not just from what we're hearing on this panel, but even through examples through the rest of the day. So the old, the old way to look at this was, well, there's advertising and there's subscription, right? There's sort of two states of the world, and you can choose one or the other, or perhaps both. And by now, we're seeing at least 10 different models. On the ad side, there's simple advertising, there's native, there's video and audio ads with different formats, 
on the user side, we've seen everything ranging from a la carte to subscription to membership to price discrimination mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And then you move beyond that where I'd say there's at least three different classes of possibilities that we've also seen over the last 25 years in media. One is, you know, you mentioned diversification, um, what I might call the pricing of compliments. Uh, you know, where did value go in music? It didn't just disappear. It went to complementary products and services like broadband access and, and um, hardware and concerts, right? I mean, it's fascinating that the price of concerts has actually exploded over the last 15 years just as file sharing increased. So that's one example. The second is what I'd probably call pricing capabilities, uh, meaning, you know, if you think about what publishers do well, there's certain things we do well, which we can actually transfer or translate into new revenue streams. Native is the simplest form. It's like we know how to create content. Oh, that's a capability that we can actually use mm -hmm. in the ad side. Or reviews, curation, right? We do curation very well. If you think about Wirecutter at the New York Times, that's a new revenue stream that we can transfer or translate mm -hmm. that into. And the last thing I would say is just creating platforms, which is obviously central to all the conversations. Uh, PRX, Spotify, going back even for newspapers. I mean, it's fascinating that newspapers were a bundle of products and platforms, right? Classified was a platform. So you take all these revenue streams and wow, the possibilities are fantastic. The question I have is, is the barrier our imagination? Or is it technology? Or is it organizational mindset? And in particular, the question I want to ask is, you know, in a sense, when we think about the possibilities from data and technology, right? Like, Brendan, you know, yours is a great example. For 25 years, I mean, we've sort of looked at the evolution of ads. Uh, by the way, 25 years ago, we said the technology is going to save advertising. <laughs> right? Those were the conversations we were having. And, and in some sense, I think what we've learned by now is technology wasn't the holy grail. It was the mindset and the way we looked at users or didn't look at the users, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the real bottleneck. Yeah. How do we solve that problem? Or would you even agree that that's a problem? Um, I, I do think it's a problem, and that's why Brave is a user-first data platform. Mm -hmm. So we do let you own your own data because it's already on your device or devices, and we even let you synchronize it across devices with uh, encryption, so we don't see it. We don't want to see your data. But um, the user was left out. Uh, the standards didn't step up, like I said, and the big, you know, superpowers emerged. I remember in the in the early 90s, people thought it would be the, like the Time Warner network would show that there'd be set-top boxes. Yeah. But then the PC rose and the web rose, and people were thinking about AOL and CompuServe, and Bill Gates was having a AOL killer being built in even in 94. Uh, and then Netscape showed it could be sort of an open web, open standard-based uh, commercial web as well as the web that existed before Netscape. And that took off and Microsoft copied it. People thought Microsoft was the giant that would be around forever, but it became sort of a shadow of itself in some ways. And no one really foresaw things like Google and then the iPhone. And, um, so the, the networks always, whether they're sort of um, ecological in real life and biology or they're computer networks, they always lead to these concentrated powers for a time. And those do tend to take advantage of their users. The users are kind of ununionized. They don't have mm -hmm. any bargaining power. They're just out there. Your friends are on Facebook, so you go there. Well, now that you're there, you're going to see ads. Um, you don't necessarily like things about it, but over time it's hard to shift to the next thing. There isn't really a next thing if you're old or you're aging with your friends, so you just stick with it. Um, I think there's a whole world out there where power goes to the edge. It can be machine learning on your devices. It can be protecting your data on your devices. It can be doing more and finer grained e-commerce of any kind, including subscriptions, contributions, upsells, from your device without intermediaries and gatekeepers. And so technology can help get past these, these artificial sort of concentrations of power. Uh, people sometimes say antitrust law should do it too. I'm not, not sure that would work, but that's, that's a topic for a different panel. Um, I think technology has a role to play, but people have to build great products, and users have to adopt them. So that's, that's how we're starting. You could also go after the creators and make great tools for them. You could, you could go after other places in the network to add value, but you have to make a great product. 
There's no way around that. I just, I just want to echo that. So the, you know, the, I think that the two things that are, that are sure, certainly true for us is what, the, what is the dif def definition of the power? Because that also is evolving in a, in a disaggregated environment. So it is, it is a little bit more like mercury. And one of the examples in our world is, you know, in the ranking of popular um, podcasts, you know, NPR really sits at the top of that, which of course makes perfect sense. They're, they're such a massive audio makers. But what is surprising is that PRX with 25 staff members actually is number two or three. Like that's a data point that is important to re remember. And it's a point of pride for us because we represent like a much more um, fluid and open, a little bit hard to contain uh, mechanism, but so the, you know, what are the definitions of power? And then also uh, the thing that's so fascinating about blockchain and Bitcoin, et cetera, is that the, the interest of managing the internet in a way that just is constantly decreasing friction mm -hmm. is really good for um, a, a more um, dispersed amount of access and information. And like it, it's something that you almost need a benevolent leader <laughs> who actually has power in that to lean into it. Yeah. So. I mean, let me just throw out one more observation, which is um, great. Um, in a sense, this is a conversation we were having some years ago. Um, and, and the statement I'm going to make is blindingly obvious in hindsight, but it's incredible sort of how we often miss this, right? Um, the power of digital is not just about saying, let's take content and then put it through these new pipes. Mm -hmm. Right. Which frankly is the way we thought about it for a long time, right? It was like, oh, digital's come along. We sort of produce stuff in the hub. People read, listen, view it in the spokes. Now we have a million more spokes that we can reach. It was all about reach. It was all about free distribution. And that's not the power of digital, right? The power of digital is really, you can connect the spokes to each other in a sense, which yeah. really, sort of underlies many of the things all of you are doing. PRX as a platform, Spotify as a platform, blockchain really using peer-to-peer -peer networks to take advantage of possibilities which wouldn't have existed uh, you know, in, in the other world. And that's, and that's something which I find really interesting, which is oftentimes when you think about content, we're saying, oh, can we actually take this content and stream it now? <laughs> at what price? But that's essentially just taking the same content and putting it in these new pipes, right? That's not really taking advantage of the power of digital. Um, it's like, yeah, it's, it is also like taking, like we see this all the time where uh, there's an assumption that a broadcast show, you just put it up on an RSS feed and there yeah. you have a podcast, which isn't true at all. It's really a very, very different medium and a very different way of talking and different technology, et cetera. So yeah, you can't, that's why I said earlier that like we think of technology, for us, distribution is a content strategy. And so the, that's why the, for us, when we build technology, we don't think of it as a thing. We think of it as the thing that holds the rest of the house up. Yeah. So. Why don't we open up for questions? Um, anyone? Yeah, so I think we should probably get a mic to you. Let's see. If you can introduce yourself. Sure, my name's Regina Buckley. Uh, I'm an executive at Time Inc. Um, and I actually, I think I have more of an observation to offer when you ask the question about there's all these great things going on, podcasting, e-commerce, native, these are all great things for publishers and what is holding publishers back. Mm -hmm. What I might offer is uh, efficiency and measurement. And so it all goes back to this ridiculous amount of data that Facebook and Google have on those consumers and it makes it really easy for the marketers to go in and buy. And so while I do think that there are areas of growth timing is one of the major publishers that looking at, that's looking at podcasting, for example. I also think the bigger challenge really ultimately goes back to what we started with a little bit earlier today, which is that data that these, the duopoly has on the consumer, and it is so much easier for a marketer to put more and more dollars there than to say, oh, here's a thoughtful podcast that is tied directly to our brand, and let's Let's spend $20,000 on it, and then let's do 10 more. And so I guess maybe I'll open that as like a, I'd love to hear the panel's feedback or thoughts on that and whether ultimately there actually is going to be room for growth for publishers uh, as long as all of the data stays with Google and Facebook. 
So I, I advise um, Sanobi, as I mentioned, and I learned that publishers who have CRM data, subscriber data, are guarding it more closely now. You know, partly it's because of all the merger and acquisition action, right? Yep. Um, Merkle gets bought by Dentsu Aegis, and suddenly the cat is among the pigeons. You don't know who to trust. Uh, that's why it's so hard to talk about owning your data. Um, you have to sort of transact. We leak data all the time. If you if you really ask users, will you you know give up some data or be trapped for a week in order to get some kind of quid pro quo, they might have enough. Um, seasonality or, or you know, re repetition that they lose more than they gain. And, it, and then over time, they just lose everything. So the same problem applies to publishers. Publishers who keep a good first party business, we heard earlier today from the Washington Post, um, they seem to be doing it right. And, and it seems necessary to do that. It's, it's, you, it's a theme now in the ad tech circles to go back to you know, direct sales and, and get control of your stack and reduce the programmatic or get the the right partners who can keep the quality and, and protect your, your, um, your, your customer data. So uh, for Brave as a browser, we, we've seen like they have nothing to do with that, but if we're representing our users, we still have to, if we want them to opt into private ads, we have to be like Facebook and let advertisers forecast or see what audience they might buy. So there's a, there's a challenge getting that anonymized data out. And you're right, the, the duopoly, they're not really collaborating in a cartel because Facebook's coming after Google. Um, but they, uh, they have a lot of data, and it's a huge path-dependent, you know, years-long thing. Um, so yeah. we have our work cut out for us. No, I was, I was just going to add, I, I think that um, it also, if you look at some of the M&A activity, um, when you look at companies who have been predominantly content companies who are looking for that distribution, they are looking for that first party data. They're saying, how do I get that direct consumer retail access um, and compete with that dynamic? So that's one observation. The other observation I would share um, to your point is when there's an explosion of different formats, the first inclination is exactly as you say, it's to lift and shift my content and simply put it, you know, you get matching a matching luggage set and let's throw it across 10 platforms. But of course, uh, bespoke content deserves bespoke, thoughtful treatment of what, how that brand should be expressed in any new form factor. And so one, the other reason that it sometimes slowed down the experimentation is that requires significant investment, really a, a thoughtful approach to what that brand essence is and how you, how you take that into those new places. So uh, one has to make room for that innovation. And so it puts pressure on companies to operate the rest of the business more efficiently. Um, and so obviously you do see, you know, uh, you know, cost cutting and other things, you know, people embracing more automation, more blending of humans and automation in the organization, looking at process improvement, consolidation, because in order to play in those new spaces, you have to make room for it because we have to be financially responsible and prudent. So those are two, two comments I would just add to, um, to that particular conversation. Hi, uh, John Keegan from the Tau Center. I just had a quick question about advertising on podcasts. Just get your mic, please. Uh, just a quick question. Um, now that iOS 11 is out, um, do you guys have more information about whether people are actually listening to ads on podcasts? Because I, I think the Apple podcast app is reporting those metrics for the first time. Uh, do you guys have any data about that? Uh, they're not out yet. They're, that is, uh, even though iOS 11 is out, the uh, back end analytics is not going to be out until December. So we don't actually know how fine grain they are, for one thing. but. In, in podcasting in particular, some of the early advertised companies are all direct response advertisers. So it's the, and so the, the theory is that those are, represent the canary in the coal mine. And so if you can make it work in the DR world, you actually have a pretty good sense that it's going to work because it's so hard. You know, you're out walking the dog. It's in your ears. You have to, there's many steps before you take an action that was said to you. And so um, that's been one of the, proof points of podcasting all along. That isn't necessarily where we want to live and stay. We need to diversify that. But that's been another indication. And Apple is not likely to help you engage your listeners. They're just likely to tell you a little bit more than what you know. And we, that there are plenty of other um, folks that host podcasts that do give you that. Like We have our, some of our podcasts on Spotify, and we actually already know some of that. So. Um, 
I think it's a brilliant so idea. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm Lana Claire Ives. I think it's a brilliant idea that you think about giving the consumer a buy-in back with potential um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. I think you know Bitcoin has been the only major, you know, um, cryptocurrency to really make a mark um, in our time. So I was also wondering if that is a source of what to do. And I really like what you said. Um, what are your thoughts on the stabilization of Bitcoin? So <laughs> we're actually and you're not, not using Bitcoin. Right? <laughs> we're not using Bitcoin right now. We started. We did a beta to bring up the contribution system with Bitcoin. Bitcoin became very expensive because of the scaling problems that it, I think is still you know laboring to fix, and it's forking over this. But these these ledgers have what's called a fork, where you get two versions, and because they're a chain of blocks, they actually can have a common ancestry that allows um, people who held the currency that was before the fork to still have it be valuable on either either side of the fork, um, depending on how the fork's done. Bitcoin became very expensive. The scaling problems are not fixed. We switched to tokens on Ethereum. We did our own basic attention token on Ethereum. Ethereum has scaling problems too, but it has a pretty lively uh, core team led by this young uh, kid, <laughs> Vitalik Buterin. So we're, we're optimistic they'll fix their scaling problems. But we think it's early in cryptocurrency land, and their value will be conserved. You know, JP Morgan's getting into this stuff. It's not going to go away. And if, if in 10 years, the, everybody's using a blockchain that's like the, 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 the child of Bitcoin and Ethereum, I wouldn't be surprised. And the value will migrate. So that's how I view it. I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. Sorry, go ahead. You got the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Sana Mohammed. I'm a student at HBS, and I'm exploring a startup in the podcasting space. And I'm, the question I have is around monetization of content. And so, well, of course, that's essentially the topic of this forum. Uh, but you know, for example, for Spotify, I've, I've gotten into long debates with friends, especially millennials who don't feel like they they don't feel like they should have to pay for any sort of content. So it's like, why do you pay for Spotify when you could get the same music on SoundCloud for free? And you know, the money is just going into the pocket of artists who are already rich. Um, and so these kind of debates, and on the same side with, with podcasts, like donating to podcasts, when the thought process is, well, you know, why Combinator's podcasts? You don't need to donate to them; they have enough money. Or even NPR, while well, you know they have plenty of money, this is the kind of thought process as to. It's really hard for um, to get content monetized. So my question is, you know, how have you guys dealt with, especially under 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 the generation that believes in getting as much for free as they can when it comes to public information to a certain extent? Uh, how do you create a mind shift or a thought process shift as in this is not a public good; it's a service that you're paying for rather than a right? Uh, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts. I have a couple of thoughts on that. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization, and so we think of revenue. As, we have to be diversified in each section, but basically, like a three-legged stool. And advertising is one uh, limb of that. Uh, listener support is another, and then we also um, get uh, philanthropic support on occasion to generate certain things or help us in innovation, technology, et cetera. And all three of those are needed because these are, I mean, we are basically helping small entrepreneurs. We're, we're an entrepreneurial nonprofit helping a bunch of small businesses that are happen to be audio artists and storytellers do their thing. And so we kind of have to, we have to pull all of those levers. Now we don't expect that all listeners will support us in any one of those ways. It's a small percentage. But we still have to pull all of those levers. And about 62% of our listeners to the Radiotopia network are under the age of 35. And we hold the record for the most donations on Kickstarter for any podcast network. So millennials are actually quite um, generous and charitable, in fact, more so than the baby boomer generation. That's, there's many um, studies about that. Now, that doesn't mean they have a lot of disposal income. So what we've had to do is make sure that 
what we offer them is something they can afford. So while there are many charities that would never think of a three or four dollar donation entry point, we do because we have to be wise about that. And it's, those are expensive donations because there's a lot of overhead with that small. But that's who, that's who loves our stuff. And we need to keep them and we need to bring them the stuff that they love so that they, and they can support us in many ways. But I feel very committed to the free access to podcasts because of that, because not everybody can. Yes, we have one, one last question there. Hi, I'm, I'm Jay Neely. Uh, I work at the Boston Globe for a time. I'm a community builder within Boston's startup scene. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on what can be done to encourage publishers to work together on technology development, specifically around syndication. Because it seems to me that one of the big areas of you know, platform challenge is that beyond just the data advantage that these, public, that these platforms have, Facebook and Google, uh, they also have a huge technology advantage Increasingly, they're taking control over how content can be distributed on their platform. Um, at the very lightest form, through things like cards, but also through things like Google AMP and Facebook Instant Pages. I think one of the reasons why a lot of publishers are really focusing on podcasts is because they contain their monetization within the standard file. It's baked in. Everyone else who's producing text content or video content that monetization, it only happens if you either have it on platform or if you get the user back to their site. RSS seems to essentially be abandoned. And there doesn't seem to be a lot of development going on to create a new syndication format from the publisher's perspective where they can really bake in some monetization features. How can we get publishers working together on this rather than just kind of independently giving up control to the platforms? Um, to I mean, I... I don't think anybody wants to answer that no, one. I, I, no, I have, a, I have a couple thoughts. I mean, one, one is I, I think that people have to be very generous with open source software. I think that's, a, that's one path. I think um, the, the technologists are not the problem. It's the business rules that uh, create a competitive environment. And, and you have to find, uh, you have to be solving a problem likely to do with friction in order to pave that through. But it's usually, the, it's, ne it's almost never the cooperative technology environment that, that's usually pretty good. Yeah, I don't, I don't, technology's not the, what's, what's holding anything back. It's, I think really the answer to most of the questions I've heard is about great experiences. And you know, you can, you know, you can come out of the rubble of piracy or other things that everything is free for content, but if you provide convenient access in a better way, in a format that's more befitting of a user, then, then that will win. But the reason that I didn't want to answer that at first is it's exceedingly hard. It's a very, very difficult thing. Um, and to conceive of what that could possibly be is like a, it's a challenge just even thinking about it. But the, I, I agree that the, the, it's the constituents all being very protective of, it's a very difficult thing to get everybody to collaborate at scale for something like that. Uh, it's not syndication, but I know of Digital Content Next. I'm friendly with Jason Kint, and they've got a bunch of publishers who've now joined forces to have a, a sort of private ad exchange with quality vendors and um, authentication and you know brand safety baked in. Uh, syndication should have been also put in the web standards in a deep way, right? Ted Nelson's Project Xanadu had micro royalties, right? Uh, the technology was envisioned and partially implemented and probably should be brought back. If you think about AR and VR, um, you're going to have the problem Second Life had where people just steal texture art and 3D models and you're going to have to solve it in a way that works in a shared world, which I think goes toward what micro royalties and things like watermarking uh, can do. So. Again, it's a matter of technology and sort of forming a league of publishers, <laughs> if you can get them. And if I could just leave us on an optimistic note, I would say if you look at what's happening in the television industry right now, people who would traditionally be looked at as competitors are now becoming collaborators. And technology is the enabler to a better experience. If we capture this, you get more content, more monetization. Um, but I think you're going to see more ecosystems start to take the technology and say, how do we take this distributed reality and, and start to come to some norms that allow us to compete effectively um, uh, unto our own strengths, so. I mean, the, the, the topic of the panel was thinking about new revenue models, but in some sense, there's, there's something just pretty fundamental about this conversation, which I wanted to uh, sort of highlight, which is, you know, when we think about strategy, it's very hard to think about revenue without thinking about 
willingness to pay of users. Yeah. Right? You, you never jump to the revenue question. You're first thinking, are people willing to pay for your product or service? And ultimately, that comes down to, are you offering something that's differentiated and meaningful to the user? And I think what I really appreciated in all the comments is a lot of what you were saying is really focused on that user experience, um, finally. <laughs> Uh, but in some sense, that's probably the first question we have to ask before we can jump to the revenue question. But thank you all. We're out of time and uh, really thank interesting you. comments. Thank you. thank you, panel. Thank you, panel. I'm not going to be the person who stands between you and a drink at this time on a Friday. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you again uh, to Dave Homer and the um, team here at HBS. Uh, digital initiative, which um, it's so great to know that there are many bright minds and very committed individuals thinking about these extremely hard problems. And I want to thank Elizabeth again who put all of this together. Um, if you have follow-up or questions, uh, we are at Tau Center on um, Twitter. And if you have research questions for myself or Nico um, at the Shorenstein or HBS, uh, please get in touch because this is a, I think we're just at the beginning of this problem rather than the end of it. Um, and the more we can learn together, the better it will be. And with that, drinks in the next door room. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.